Hi guys, Olive here, here today to talk to you about what I read in August of 2018. August ended up being a very strange reading month. I ended up being disappointed by books I thought I was going to love, but the month did have some high points. So let's first talk about a book I spontaneously picked up on audio at the beginning of the month. That is The Bellwether Revivals by Benjamin Wood. As I said, I did listen to this one on audio, and while I was partially inspired to pick it up because it is a campus novel, and this is my favorite time of the year to read campus novels, I have to say the main motivator to finally listen to this one is that I'm trying to clear out my Audible catalog so I can justify resubscribing. This is the Secret History-esque tale of Oscar, who is a nursing aide at an assisted living facility just outside of Cambridge. One night on his way home from work, he is passing by a church and is drawn into it because of the beautiful organ music that is coming from inside. As a result of this, he ends up meeting siblings Iris and Eden, two very well-off and highly intelligent kids. Cambridge students. Oscar and Iris end up really hitting it off, and she invites him into her and her brother's very tightly knit group of friends, giving Oscar a sense of sophistication and inclusion that he lacked so acutely in his very cold working class upbringing. But as Oscar and Iris get closer, she starts to voice concerns about the mental stability of her older brother Eden, who really believes that his music has healing powers beyond the realm of what is currently thought possible. She thinks he needs help. That is, until his stunts seem to start having results. But before the whole group knows it, Eden is spiraling out of control and straight into tragedy. I have been wanting to read this book for a really long time because, as I said, it's a campus novel, but also because Benjamin Wood's second novel, The Ecliptic, was my favorite novel of 2016. Benjamin Wood seems to really excel at examining mental illness in his books. Both this book and The Ecliptic both dealt with that. It seems like his third book that was just recently published that I also ordered is going to explore some similar things as well. This was a fairly strong novel. It was certainly compelling, but I have to say that the relationships between the characters fell a little flat for me. I never really felt a spark between Iris and Oscar, which is a very important thing for this story. And also the dynamic between that group of college friends was kind of lacking. There wasn't the energy or the zippiness that I come to expect from a secret history-esque formula. So it was a good novel, but not a great one. The next book that I picked up in August was another Audible selection as I went through my catalog trying to clear it out, and that was Homegoing by Yaa Jesse. This book was hugely popular here on Booktube a couple years ago, so of course I wanted to give it a little cooling off period before I picked it up myself. But I have to say, now that I have finally read this book, I see what everyone loves about it. I really enjoyed it. When talking about this book, I hesitate to even refer to it as a novel. It's more like interconnected short stories. Everything starts off in this book in the 18th century on the Gold Coast of Africa, which is modern day Ghana. An Ashanti woman named Mame has two daughters, but the two never meet, in fact, don't even know about each other until very late into their lives. Due to events that happen in the first couple of stories in this book, the two become separated by an ocean, an occurrence that will physically drive apart their descendants for generations to come. And this is how we go through the book, with each subsequent chapter being dedicated to a descendant from the next generation of each sister's bloodline. We oscillate back and forth between the descendants of each sister, seeing how radically different, but also how equally difficult each of the situations are. I found myself getting so absorbed in each individual story. They never overstay their welcome, but they always give you enough material to become invested and to be able to see the bigger picture. I honestly have very little else to say about it because it was just really good. I loved the story. I loved the writing. This is absolutely something I would want to reread in the future. So if you were like me and were putting this book off for whatever reason, I urge you to pick it up finally. The third book that I picked up in August was my pick off of my young professional TBR for the month, and that was The Big Short, Inside the Doomsday Machine by Michael Lewis. This book is the story of the 2008 financial crisis or more specifically, the stories of the small handful of people who had the smarts and also the insight to foresee the crash. In case you did not previously know, the financial crisis was largely caused by something called 
subprime mortgages, which basically means mortgages given to people who had no business getting them in the first place. These very risky loans were then all bundled together into bonds, given an inflated rating as to their creditworthiness, and then sold. But as homeowners started defaulting on these loans, the whole financial industry basically imploded. Looking back on the financial crisis, it's hard to understand how no one saw this coming. But in fact, a few people did, and they made a whole lot of money based on the fact that they did by betting against these loans and winning. Now, I work in financial services, so take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt. But I think that Michael Lewis took a potentially very confusing subject matter and spun it into a palatable, engaging story that will have you on the edge of your seat. I couldn't put this book down, even though this is nonfiction, and we all know how this story ends. I loved his writing, I loved how he portrayed all the relevant actors in the story, and I love how he answered just about any question you may have had about why this happened. He made it all understandable while still adequately pointing at the lunacy of what was going on. For a book about a crisis, this was a hell of a lot of fun. Never thought I'd say that. <laughs> Another fantastic piece of nonfiction that I picked up during the month of August was Eggshell Skull, a memoir about standing up, speaking out, and fighting back by Brie Lee. I picked this book up off of the recommendation of Jacqueline over at Six Minutes for Me, who has a newer booktube channel that you absolutely must be following. There was just something about this book that made me want to pick it up immediately when it arrived from Book Depository. As the subtitle says, this is a memoir of Brie Lee's time spent as a judge's associate in Australia. During this time, she she traveled with her judge where they were presented with horrific case after horrific case, mainly sexual crimes, almost exclusively committed against women and children. It is also during this time that Brie starts contemplating whether or not she should finally file charges against the young man who committed a sexual assault against her during her childhood. This book is a fistful of raw emotion ready to strike out. This was a tremendously difficult period in Bree's life, and she is very honest in her portrayal of that. I think if I were to pick one thing about this book that was the most compelling, and by compelling, I mean infuriating, it was when Brie takes you through each stage of the court process. So beginning with the reporting of the crime, she takes you through every subsequent step, tells you what the name of it is, and tells you the rate at which cases are either thrown out or dropped during each stage and for what typical reasons. This book will make you so angry. It will break your heart, but it will make you so damn proud of Brie Lee for the perseverance that she shows. This was definitely not an easy read, but a very, very important one that I urge you to pick up. The next book I'll be talking about is Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert, translated by Eleanor Marks. This was my pick off of my classics TBR for the month that I ended up really not caring for. This is the tale of Emma Bovary, a young woman who marries a prematurely widowed doormat of a doctor. Emma very quickly becomes dissatisfied with her life, has a couple of petty affairs, and basically ruins everyone's lives. Now, normally when I don't like the story of a book, I'm pretty cut and dry about not liking the book as a whole. But this one is really hard because the writing in it is so beautiful. I really wanted to get invested in this book because of how lyrical the prose was. At the beginning of the book, I think Flaubert did a wonderful job in portraying Emma's dissatisfaction. He portrayed it as though she was kind of standing on the other side of a foggy window looking in on all the happy people, but not being able to join them in their contentedness. But then again, the very, very beginning of this book just showed us portions from the doctor's early life and during his upbringing, which served no purpose other than to show how lazy and vanilla he is. I failed to see any larger point or themes to the story. I thought it was just really frivolous and boring and at the end of the day, not for me. During the month of August, I also read a book called Ecstasy by Mary Sherratz. I buddy read this book with Maeve over at Scribble Maven. This is historical fiction about real life Austrian socialite and composer Alma Mahler. This book takes on a pretty good chunk of the very interesting life she led. In the book, Alma is a very creatively driven and passionate young woman who desires to pursue her love of and talent for composing 
proposing even as her mother and stepfather are pressuring her to marry. She at first falls deeply in love with her music teacher, only to later be swept off her feet by famous composer Gustav Mahler. She at first hopes that Mahler could be a type of mentor as well as her lover, but Mahler makes it abundantly clear before they are married that they both cannot be composing if they are going to have a successful marriage, and so she gives up her first and truest love, music, to be the woman behind Gustav Mahler. The book then chronicles the life that they lead together with their relationship as well as Alma's hampered spirit at the core of this novel. This was one of my most anticipated new releases of 2018 because of how much I enjoyed Mary Sherratt's previous book, Daughters of the Witching Hill, but unfortunately this book was just okay. It wasn't bad, but it was rather hollow. During our buddy read of this book, Maeve and I had a couple of really illuminating conversations when we were trying to put a finger on why exactly this book wasn't working for us in the way that we wanted to, and we both kind of agreed that it seemed like the author was afraid to go as far as she needed to. In the afterword of this book, Mary Sherratt is talking about all the different sources that she consulted and the impression that she got of who Alma Mahler was as a person when she was doing her research. And she said in that afterword that Alma Mahler was a very complex and contradictory character, but that's not the way she portrayed her in the book. In the book, she's kind of like this tortured philosophizer. We're told in the book that it's absolute agony for Alma to be separated from her music, and yet we don't get any sections in the book of seeing her actually physically composing. There is plenty of talk in the book about how her music or even how Gustav's music makes her feel, but for a book about music, there's very little actual music in it. Maeve and I concluded that it seems like Mary Sherratt wasn't really interested in doing the additional research that would have been necessary to really nail that component. But without that side of things rounding out this book, it rendered it kind of a flopping fish. And it is a damn shame that that ended up being the case because there is some really beautiful writing in portions of this book. Just very disappointing overall. The last book that I will be talking about at length in this video is Confessions by Kanai Minato, translated by Steven Snyder. This is a book that I have been eyeing up ever since Stephanie over at That's What She Read raved about this book. This book takes place in Japan and it's kind of a campus novel, although the students in this book are very young, middle school aged. At the very beginning of this book, a teacher stands in front of her class of students and announces that she will be resigning. Her four-year-old daughter has recently drowned on campus grounds, and while the teacher is explaining why she can no longer be their teacher, she claims that this death, which was ruled an accident, was no accident, and in fact, some students in their very midst are responsible for her death. After this shocking announcement, we then jump from perspective to perspective, seeing the aftermath of this event from people involved, as well as from people on the periphery. This teacher is looking for revenge, and the ways in which she goes about it will render you speechless. This was one that I picked up on audio after an unfortunate string of disappointing reads, and let me tell you, this was fantastic. I binged through the entire audiobook in one morning. It was so twisty turny. It was shocking. I was sending Stephanie Voxer messages like, oh my god, that first chapter. So if you are looking for a fast paced, binge worthy thriller, consider this one. And the final two books that I read in August are actually books that I have previously discussed in a dual fantasy review video that I did a few weeks ago. The first of those books is The Poppy War by R.F. Kuang. As I said, this is a fantasy novel that takes inspiration from 20th century Chinese history, in which we follow heroine Rin, who goes from war orphan to military academy student to very unconventional soldier in a brutal war. This was basically two novels in one, but ended up being rather lackluster due to weak characterization and excessive violence. And the other book that I reviewed in that video alongside The Poppy War was Spinning Silver by Naomi Novik. This was indisputably my most anticipated new release of 2018. This is Naomi Novik's follow-up to her enormously successful fairy tale retelling book, Uprooted, but where Uprooted takes inspiration from Beauty and the Beast, Spinning Silver puts a spin on the classic fairy tale Rumpelstiltskin. This one broke my heart for all of the wrong reasons, failing to be even 
remotely as captivating as Uprooted, and thoroughly confusing matters with endless point of view characters and absolutely zero world building. Disappointed doesn't even come close to how I'm feeling about this book. So if you would like to hear more of my thoughts on either or both of these books, I will link my dual review video down below for you to watch. So those were all of the books that I read in August. It was a little bit all over the place. I'm hoping that September will be entirely more successful. Please let me know in the comment section below if you've read any of these books, what you thought of them, if you now want to read them after hearing me talk about them, or if you have any more general comments or questions, those can also go in the comment section below. But you can also reach out to me on a variety of different places on social media. The links to all of my profiles are linked in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I will see you in the next video. Bye.